It is the late Jurassic, 155 million years ago, a time when the dinosaurs have come into their full strength, spreading across the world and evolving into numerous unique families. The largest are the sauropods, easily recognizable by their long necks and tails. Here in Argentina, it is no different, with species like Tylucosaurus, a 15 meter long, 7 meter tall giant, closely related to its North American cousin, Camarasaurus. They, like many others, feed on the leaves of tall trees, inaccessible to other herbivores. They also live in herds for mutual protection, with the adults protecting the small individuals from predators. But deeper in the forest itself is a completely different sauropod, one that seems to have forsaken many of the key features that make this family so special. Brachytraca lopan are small for sauropods, growing to between 9 and 11 meters long and weighing up to 5 tons. But by far the strangest thing about them is their incredibly short neck making it a standout from all sauropods. For them, trees are far out of reach, but this is no issue as Brachytracolopan are low browsers, able to chow down on everything from the forest floor to up to 2 meters in the air. Though they are far less reached than their normally proportioned relatives, so they have to move around far more frequently. Being small does come with some changes in social behavior as well. Sauropods in general don't raise their young, who have to fend for themselves until reaching a large enough size that they can join an adult herd. For large species like the Dalekosaurus, they have to be about 40% the size of the adults before they can join, and this takes many years. For the Brachytracolopan, juveniles form in with adult herds at a much earlier age, having only to grow to about 3 meters, so they get adult protection much quicker. This herd is made up of 8 adults and 22 juveniles of various ages and sizes. Though the adults can easily be seen above the undergrowth, many of the younger members are hidden within the dense foliage, though the herd do leave a path of cleared plants as they graze. Most of the time their days are peaceful, very few predators are large enough to hunt the fully grown Brachytracolopan, so most carnivores steer well clear of them. But not all. Out on the plains, the Telecosaurus herd have spotted a predator, a 6 meter abelosaur. He is probing the herd to see if there are any individuals small enough for him to attack, but the tall herbivores spot him well before he even gets close. As he approaches, some of the closer members face him and stomp the ground with their forelimbs as a warning. The abelosaur doesn't even have a chance to get near the herd and gives up. Out in the open, he has little hope of stealthily approaching such large prey, so begins to track down a possibly easier group. Elsewhere, the Brachytracolopan herd graze as they lumber through the ferns, shrubs and trees. Their only concern being what they're going to bite into next. Behind them, the Abelosaur is closing in, following their scent and using the dense foliage as cover. The predator hasn't been spotted yet. He is just over half a ton, so the adults are far out of his league, but he can see multiple smaller members that he could easily take down. He just had to get to them. Lowering himself, the hunter almost disappears amongst the plant life, and takes a long detour away from the herd. Time goes by, and the Brachytracolopan continue on their path, most of them barely noticing the occasional rustling of leaves or the footsteps that are far too fast to be one of them. Whenever any of the small sauropods lifts their heads to check the surroundings, the noises stop, and with the stimulus gone, they lose interest and go back to feeding. Just out of sight, the abelosaur watches and waits, scanning each potential target, ready to seize on any of the prey's slip-ups. One of the female Brachytracolopan watches as a juvenile passes between her neck and front legs, moving to a fresh patch of ferns. The three meter male waddles away from her and doesn't realize he is far from any adult. The female keeps one eye on him and barely notices the soft sound of footsteps getting closer and closer, nor the parting plants forming a path right to the juvenile she is watching. 
The open jaws of the abelosaur erupt from the foliage, and in the blink of an eye, it grabs the young sauropod by the tail and yanks it back, dragging the little male away. What is left is the fading sound of the predator running through the dense underbrush and the occasional bleat of the doomed youngster. The female lets out an alarm call, but it is too late. Even as the adults go on alert and the juveniles rush to be near them, only the female who saw the attack knows they have lost a member of the herd. Because of this, the rest of the Brachytrachalopans soon go back to feeding. With their heads normally kept low to the ground, they often don't see threats coming, and in general have very slow reflexes. So fast predators can negate the protection the adults give to smaller members of the herd. And even fully grown, there are larger predators than the Abelosaur out there. Ones easily capable of taking down a fully grown Brachytrachalopan. Forcing the species to constantly hide as best they can, and rarely venture out into the open. Hello fellow travelers, and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down the sauropod with the shortest neck of them all, Brachytrachalopan. The first and only remains of Brachytrachalopan were discovered in the Chabut province of Argentina part of the Canadon Calcerio Formation. It was named Brachytrachalopan mezai. In 2005, the species name honors Daniel Messi, the shepherd that discovered the fossils. The genus name means short-necked pan, pan being the Greek god of shepherds, amongst other things. While incomplete, the holotype was found in articulation and contained many vertebra, ribs, parts of the pelvis, and parts of the left leg. Other sections appear to have been lost due to erosion, including the all-important skull, but sauropod skulls in general are extremely rare. It was found to be a Dicreosauridae sauropod, a group known for being small and having short necks for their family. It lived during the Oxfordian to the Typhonian periods of the late Jurassic, between 160 and 150 million years ago. Using other species as references, Brachytrachalopan is estimated to have grown to between 10 and 11 meters in length, stood 2.5 meters tall at the hip, and weighed around 5 tons. Now one may think that this specimen's small size could be explained by it being a juvenile, but the fusing of the neural arches and the centras indicate that this individual was indeed mature, though sutures in the pre-sacral region do indicate that it hadn't finished growing, which is to say it could have grown slightly more but was effectively an adult when it died. As said earlier, Brachytrachalopan belonged to the Dicreosauridae family, which included other rather small-sized short neck species with tall neural spines. These include the more famous Amargosaurus, also from Argentina, and Dicreosaurus itself from Tanzania. Even compared to them, Brachytrachalopan had an extremely short neck, being only 2 meters long, 40% shorter than the average Dicreosaurid, making it the shortest neck of all sauropods. So why did it evolve to become like this? After all, if you ask the average person to describe a sauropod, they'll likely say they're huge and have long necks. Diet and niche partitioning have been seen as the main driving forces behind its adaptations. Brachytrachalopan and its close relatives seem to be lowbrowsers or even grazers. In fact, the cervical neural arches on its neck would have greatly restricted its dorsal flexion, so much so it may not have been able to raise its head no more than 2 meters off the ground, though it could easily reach down to the ground. So it was specialized in feeding on plants from ground level up to 2 meters. Being restricted to this may be why the species didn't need to grow to the massive sizes of its relatives, or that the species shrank down to better make use of low-lying flora. It is noted that ornithopods are mostly absent from the Gondwanan sediments, including those that Dicreosaurids are known from. With that in mind, they were living in a similar time to the more famous Morrison Formation, which included famous species such as Brachiosaurus, Diplodocus, Apatosaurus, Allosaurus, and, more importantly for this subject, Ornithopods, such as Stegosaurus, Dryosaurus, and Camptosaurus. Without these species, or with fewer of them present, to fill the role of large lowbrowser, 
the sauropods evolved to fill this niche, resulting in species like Brachytraca lupan. Though we don't have the skull, which would help to confirm that it was indeed adapted for low browsing, it may have looked similar to Diplodocus, as Diplodocidae are the sister taxon to the Dicreosaurids, or it may have been wide, like Nigerosaurus, another small, short-necked genus from Niger. Of course, becoming small would have left them more open to attack from a wider range of predators, though at the size of an elephant, it wasn't exactly a pushover. Some of the species Brachytracolopan lived alongside include Telecosaurus, a macronarian sauropod, Pandora veneta, a basal tetanurin, Almadasuchus, a crocodilomorph, and fragmentary remains of an unnamed abelosaur and an unnamed stegosaur. Overall, it does seem that sauropods were far better adapted to being massive high browsers, as very few species got close to Brachytracolopan size, and later dinosaur families like the iguanodontids and hadrosaurs would come to fill the large low browser niche. Still, the Dicreosauridae family in general is an excellent example of how adaptive sauropods were, showing they were most certainly not restricted to being the largest land animals ever. Brachytracolopan itself is almost comical in its appearance, a near polar opposite to what everyone expects sauropods to look like. And if anything, that makes me respect it even more. But what do you think of Brachytracolopan? And for my question of the week, do you think there are any benefits for sauropod species to get smaller instead of larger? What lesser known dinosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.